Thank you, Wanda. You know how they uh, show these uh, stunt drivers and they come to a parking place and they're screaming along and they, well, Wayne, you could probably do this. You raced. And they slide that thing right in the spot and stop. That's why I feel like this morning. <laughs> um, so good to see you. It's, as always, it's so good to be here, isn't it? What a refuge. And I know I've said it before. I probably will repeat it. Um, it becomes more and more like a refuge. And that's a really good thing to connect with our God to just to be able to understand what it means. I was reading something. Oh, I know what it was. It was some, one of the last things in my, in my message notes. And, it's, and I spoke of when the Son of God raises us up on the last day. And just sometimes the reality hits us when the Son of God raises you up. Raises <laughs> the Son of God. If I were a black preacher, I would, I would roll with that for a while. When the Son of God raises you up, Richard, on the last day. And you, Donna, raises you up, raises us up. And it just grabbed me. And uh, so what do we do? We, we honor him. We, we can't pay back. We can't earn it. But we can certainly honor him, can't we? But our love first to him, our loyalty to him, our devotion to him this morning, our worship to him and our attentiveness to his word. It's a wonderful thing. Yes. Did you uh, notice in the news Yes. Uh, kind of going along, overruled Cuomo's uh, restriction on churches in New York. So it kind of, I think that sets the stage for all of us. That's a big one. <laughs> I'm telling you, her and her husband, do you remember the day he was sitting over here <laughs> and, and, and Siri was giving him instructions how to get some? <laughs> or the day actually... I held the button too long on, I guess it had to have been my iPad, and uh, Siri was asking me questions. So I always say, the first time I get upset with someone for forgetting that phone, I'll be the very next one. So, well, no, no, they don't. And uh, it's a part of our world, and uh, it can be a very good part of our world too, so much of the time. So, Uncle Joe, good to see you made it. I was getting ready to call over there. I thought, well, maybe I'd call over there and get Randy out of bed. He cut church last Sunday. He had something going on at Mayo. I'm not sure what that was, but it, he had a good trip. Yeah. Yeah. So, let's, uh, where'd I put my bulk? And we got a couple of things to announce, and then we will pray, and then we will sing. Uh, December 7, men's study. December 14, board meeting. January 10, annual meeting coming up. Uh, tonight will continue in Daniel 5. We have all of our services this week. Prayer meeting at 6 p.m. Uh, anything else I need to bring our attention to, uh, announcement-wise? And then do you do we have... Uh, yes, Lee. The tree up. I think that was Janet. Isn't this beautiful? Of course, Janet did it, so it's always beautiful. And this... This stuff here is just, uh, yeah, and then and then uh, I see pointing at Steve. <laughs> but now, it wouldn't be very nice to say the dumb labor, but I mean, yeah. I mean, I've called my, I've called my, I've called myself that. I'd say I'm the dumb labor, but uh, I mean, I'm, somebody help me. I need a different word. That just doesn't sound very nice. But yeah, we thank you, Steve. We uh, we uh, we thank you. Yeah, it, it's it's a blessing, and uh, and I, I walked in and uh, you know I just think the church what God's done with the church and uh, you know he he did all of that. We had people working on it, but we know that God's the one who did that, and that's a good thing. So yeah, thank you both, and uh, you can talk to me later about my mean comments, Steve. <laughs> Did I hear an amen over here? We will. 
Um, prayer, do we have uh, prayer concerns? We Well, we just, Chuck just told me that uh, Kenny, um, Kenny and Donna both, Kessler, have COVID. He's in Peoria Intensive Care on a Respirator. Do I, do I have that right? Ventilator. Ventilator. I wouldn't know the difference, but... And we'll keep them in our prayers. Carol Provine uh, is in the hospital with COVID-19. Yeah, I just found that out this week uh, through Rosalie. I, I guess it's okay to say that. I don't... I haven't been told not to pass that on. Is she in McCall? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... It's a, it's a very, it's very real. Um, we still don't really know everything that we could, but yes. Pastor, I am proud today. I, uh, I want to say something. My, my uh, son was up Thursday uh -huh. Thanksgiving. He made a major announcement. He's got three dogs. He announced that he's going to have a baby in April. The first one, and I am tickled pink, but I didn't think he ever would. Stacy. They're going to have a baby. Well, I thought you were giving a puppy announcement for a minute. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you know, this it, it kind of had me confused there for a minute. Well, yeah, we're thankful for that too. Yeah. Yes. John's going under the weather today. Okay. Keep John in our prayers. So, um, I'm taking this off for a sec. Mm -hmm. I just want everyone in this room and every, and every soul that isn't here, that attends here, to know how thankful I am that I have you all. Amen. And I am, was thanking God this morning, which I do often for all of you, but I am so thankful to him for bringing me to mm -hmm. this little church because... Hear an amen? Yeah. Amen. The place, like Pastor says, this is a refuge. It and, is. Um, I had a text Lori, Pastor and Carrie's daughter, last night, and she texts back to me how she feels when she comes in mm -hmm. to this church building, the love and the spirit of God that is here. And I just say amen to all of that. And I just want to thank you all. Amen. Thank you. And we let God build that and grow that, and it's a great thing. I think I saw a hand. Yeah. Uh, we had a great grandson uh, born on Thanksgiving Day. Oh, my. Oh. Uh, yes, Brooke and uh, Ethan. Right. Okay. Great grandson born on Thanksgiving Day. Poor kid. What's his name? He'll be six years old before he realizes all the hoopla is and just for Clint. Clint Barrett. Yeah, very happy for them. Okay, I think I saw another, yeah. Uh, like Nathan Alcadine, and I understand a lot about the situation, but he definitely needs prayer. Yeah, pray for Uncle Dean. Mm -hmm. Dean Jefferson, yeah. And the family, the family. And the family. All, we, we, we're well familiar with how, yeah, aren't we? We know that, just how it just reaches out, touches so many, so many people. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you that we can come together. Um, I think of this so much in our Wednesday groups, how you draw us together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and you do that on Sunday morning also. And uh, as Debbie said, Lord, how thankful we are that you've brought us here, made us a part of this, and it is you who have done it. How we praise you. We just thank, thank you along with her for the fellowship that we have. We thank you for, with and for Ethan and Brooke for this uh, little boy and uh, Clint Barrett and pray that he will grow, that they will train him and he will grow to be uh, a man of God, uh, light in this dark world. We lift uh, Kenny and uh, before you, um, Kenny Kessler and Donna uh, before you, healing for this COVID-19, for Carol Provine also. Lord, we lift them up. Uh, Lord, we're so weak and frail. Uh, even the strong in this world uh, 
there's a fragility and a frailty there that uh, we we just don't we don't realize being finite fallen beings so we thank you so much that you the great shepherd care for us uh, from the first instance of belief uh, to forever uh, you care for us you walk with us your rod your staff they go before us thank you for the spirit of true brotherly love and concern this morning in our midst and uh, we pray holy spirit that we will just get quieter and quieter in our hearts and closer in our hearts to you this morning as you lead us through this worship time we link bring a uh, Dean Jefferson and family before you. And uh, we know the, the, the difficult moments that they're, that they're facing. And, and we bring, uh, we, we thank, praise you along with uh, Randy and Kelly for the announcement uh, of a grandbaby. Um, anything that I might have forgotten, Lord, and unspoken things that are on our hearts and minds, we bring those before you. Uh, just help us now to... Uh, allow you to push everything aside and we can we can worship you and it would be strength and health and, and tonic to our souls in Jesus name amen just heard the trumpet sounding and now his face I see oh the king is coming the king is coming praise God he's coming for me soon and very soon we are going to see the king Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. No more crying there. We are going to see the King. No more crying there. We are going to see the King. No more crying there. We are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to see the King. Hallelujah.
Let's pray again. Lord, through the Apostle Peter, you call us to, if we preach, to preach, to speak, to teach as the words of God. And honestly, we don't know how you could do that through such feeble instruments, but it is the work of God, and we pray that that is what will be honored this morning, that we will hear you, uh, because the vessel was bowed low before you in study and presentation and interpretation and in everything. Holy Spirit of God, how we love you. You're so patient with us, long suffering as some of our scriptures tell us very long suffering we thank you for the promises of your word mighty god you tell us everything we need to know past present future direct our hearts to you now to, to know your presence to hear your voice Holy Spirit of God in leading the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why study Bible prophecy? Why study Bible prophecy? In today's text, we're given an excellent example as to why we should study Bible prophecy. First Thessalonians 4.18 tells us, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. We've been given a very specific purpose for teaching the prophecy of the rapture of the church to encourage one another. So then we need to study these words so that we know what these words mean so that with these words we will be able to encourage one another. Specific purpose. It's also helpful for us to understand the purpose of prophecy in the Bible in general. So we have specifically and then generally understanding. So here's a very broad overview. In the Bible, God speaks to us. He reveals to those who have an ear to hear everything we need to know about the past, the present, and the future. With prophecy, God gives us everything we need to know about certain future events. Also, in understanding the importance of prophecy. You may or may not have previously considered this, but after we are given the account of creation in the first two chapters of Genesis, much of the Bible, if not most, centers around or directs our attention to two main Bible prophecies. Well, what are those two main prophecies of Scripture, you may wonder? The first coming of the Son of God and the second coming of the Son of God. We are entering the season in which people all over the world will, in one way or another, celebrate his first coming, what we call Christmas. Christmas may not seem so much like prophecy to us since it now has a 2,000 year history, but to give us some perspective for the first 4,000 years of earth history, the coming of Messiah, the first coming of Messiah was a prophesied future event. That'll give a gal perspective, won't it? The time from the cryptic prophecy of Genesis 3.15 until the birth of Jesus to Mary and Joseph was four millennia, 4,000 years. So for 4,000 years, the followers of God, they watched and they waited. 
and they watched, and they waited. And now for two millennia, the followers of God have been doing the same thing, except this time we are watching and waiting for Christ's second coming, the second main prophesied event in Scripture. In our text this morning, we will learn how to encourage one another with these words as we study the next event on God's prophetic calendar, the rapture of the church. First, this morning, we are up to your notes now. The purpose of the biblical teaching of the rapture is to bring hope to believers. The purpose of any prophecy is not to satisfy curiosity. It, it's not like a mysterious whodunit. There's very good reasons why God gives us these prophetic events. And we have very specifically here in our Thessalonians text that it's to bring hope to believers. First Thessalonians 4.13 But we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. What he's saying it here was you have to realize the hope we have so you're not grieving, so you're not sorrowing, so you're not filled with sadness. Informing our brothers and sisters in Christ with the biblical teaching of the rapture should displace sorrow and distress with hope. Grieving out of the way, filled with hope. Believers have hope. Now we know that, but we really do need to know that. Romans 15, 13, May the God of hope fill you, fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. A man, a, writ, a book that I've uh, read through most of, well, I've read and, and listened to, I'm doing, doing both, is uh, Can We Still Believe in the Rapture? And this was part of my background study for this message and other things uh, coming up. And he said he, he sat and uh, he said it was a friend of his and he was listening to this, to this man preach. And this man did not have a firm belief in uh, the teaching of the rapture of the church. And he basically, he ended his uh, message, this man, this Ed Henson was one of the authors of this book, was sitting in, in, the, in the audience, and, and then his friend ended his message with, so we can only expect trouble, trouble, and guess what? More trouble. And he, the congregation just let out a corporate moan. And he said he wanted to stand up and say the words, the, the 418, therefore encourage one another <laughs> with these words. Quite a contrast. You've, you've been in those situations. I certainly have. It's like the old, um, what, what was the, the, the show with the banjos and hee-haw, like the old hee-haw. You've, you've been there in those classes. You've heard those messages. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. The preacher or a teacher so far off track forgot completely that our God is a God of hope. And his intent is for us to abound in hope. 1 Timothy 1.1 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus, our hope. Titus 2.13 Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Believers have hope, but unbelievers do not have hope. They have no hope. 
In contrast to the position of hope of the believer, unbelievers have no hope, and so they rightfully grieve and are sorrowful. But those who believe in Christ, they don't die. When they die, they don't die. They sleep. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Well, in our text there, it said, <clears throat> it spoke of, about those who are asleep. And if you're like me, I thought that was used more like a euphemism. You know, like we say, we don't want to say someone died till we say they passed on or they, they passed away. But this term here is so much more than that. And, uh, and I was listening to a MacArthur message. I don't know why I didn't see it before. And I don't know why I didn't think. I, I, I thought that little of that text that God would just use something like that for a euphemism. But no, sleep. As used to, if it, if it was just a euphemism, that we would miss the point of Paul's instruction. Sleep, as used here, is a biblical truth regarding the privileged position of the believer in Christ. It's not just a euphemism. It's not Paul was trying to soften the blow. No, he's, he's introducing us to this concept. It's a privileged position that we have. And we can look at the John 11, 25 and 26 that I read and see that when we die, we don't really die. When an unbeliever dies, they really die. They have no hope. So, the privileged position of the believer in Christ in contrast to the no-hope position of death and judgment of an unbeliever. And here, we need to understand then as we speak these words of encouragement to, to those around us, the believer who lives in the sorrow and heaviness of heart of an unbeliever who has no hope should seek the Lord that he or she may be able to believe his word and trust him to act in his tender mercies and love and goodness toward him or her. And we're going to see later where we can come alongside someone who's struggling with this to, to help them see the promises of God's word. It's actually what I'm doing this morning, isn't it? We have a section in there. We won't spend a lot of time on this, but the no hope position of unbelievers. And this will, this will, you'll understand this, <clears throat> the significance of this more as we move along. But the no hope position of unbelievers, Ephesians 2.12, remember that, at that you were at that time separated from Christ before you came to Christ. Remember that at that time you separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant, covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. All unbelievers. This is where they were before they came to Christ. And this is where all unbelievers are. They have no hope. So in Revelation 2.11, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Well, the one who doesn't, the one who does not believe will be hurt by the second death. And they will not be part of the first resurrection. The second death will have power over them. And the second death is the lake of fire. You have all those scriptures. <clears throat> Conclusion there. We should assure believers of their hope in Christ, but be careful to not give false assurance to unbelievers who do not have hope. Do not use the Bible to give false hope. And it happens so much in our country and in our world. Second, this morning, the hope we receive from the biblical teaching this is so powerful. I just, I, was just, I just could hardly wait to share this with you. The hope we receive from the biblical teaching of the rapture is based on the gospel, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, here's the basis for it. So since... We believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. 
And we're going to have that will unfold more. We will see this is speaking of here's the foundation. Uh, you'll see the, the comparison of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. I'm going to go down to verse 3. I wanted you to have all, all of these verses, but I'm going to start in verse 3. And uh, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. Well, he just said that in Thessalonians, didn't he? In accordance with the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day. That's what we're just told, the foundation for the teaching of the rapture. The, prom the foundation for God's promise to catch us up to him on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. John MacArthur, the blessed hope of the rapture is not based on the shifting sands of philosophical speculation, nor is it religious mythology, a fable concocted by well-meaning people to comfort those who grieve. The marvelous truth that the Lord Jesus Christ will return to gather believers to himself is based on three unshakable pillars. The death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and the word of Christ, the revelation of Christ. So first we see we believe, Paul says, since we believe that Jesus died. Well, we believe, so check that one off, we believe that Jesus died. Second, we believe that Jesus rose again. He said, now then you should fully believe that he is going to come again and take you to himself. The logical sequence, then believe that God, through Jesus, will bring us to himself. And Jesus gave them that promise before he left this earth. John 14, verse 1. <clears throat> Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I would go. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am you may be also. Third this morning, the source of the detailed teaching of the rapture that we find in our text this morning is a word from the Lord himself. So the three unshakable pillars, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and the word of Christ. First Thessalonians 4.15 For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who, <clears throat> that we who are alive who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. <clears throat> For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds, so to, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. The detailed teaching of the rapture is a word from the Lord. And what we'll see, well, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just read this. Uh, MacArthur states it very well. Paul's teaching on the rapture was not his own speculation, but direct revelation from God. The phrase, this we say to you by the word of the Lord, has the authoritative tone of an inspired writer revealing what God has dis disclosed to him, end quote. What this text, what the, and what our, our commentators and our scholars believe that this wasn't just something that was this common knowledge that for this specific instruction here that Paul is giving us on the rapture of the church that Jesus Christ himself gave him these specific words this detailed account that we're not going to look at the stated facts of the rapture in this text given to us by a word from the Lord which is is very personal and it's very powerful and what it also tells us is these are things that he really wants us to know to be able to hang on to rock under our feet firm foundation that we have so first, we who are alive will not precede those who have fallen asleep. 
The Thessalonians, one of their concerns, because they were thinking the imminent return, that Christ could come any time, but then they were thinking, well, what about these believers who have died? What's going to, to happen to them? And so that was part of the reason for, for writing this, part of the reason Paul addressing this. <clears throat> so what we'll have, all the people that you know uh, uh, that, have, that knew the Lord, and that they're in the grave now, they're, what's left of their bodies is in the grave now. Okay, let's just use my mom and dad. I know they were believers in the Lord. So they're the dead in Christ. They're the ones who, even though they died, they didn't really die. They have this privileged position. They, they sleep. The, their soul, they immediately went to be with the Lord. But their bodies, now, and our bodies are significant to the Lord. We're not going to be just spirits floating around in heaven. So, what he's saying, those who are alive will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So if the rapture comes this afternoon, and uh, which wouldn't be great if it did, but if it comes this afternoon, we won't proceed. I wouldn't proceed, my mom and dad. Second, the Lord himself will descend and signal his coming with a threefold announcement. His coming is announced with the cry of command, the voice of an archangel, and the sound of the trumpet of God. Now, now let me let you in on something. You're not going to have delayed takeoff because you're, what, you know, it, we're not going to be like, um, you know, like, what is, what is that sound? No, we're going to see, we're going to see what happens when that, when that, the cry of command, the voice of the archangel and the sound of the trumpet. We're going to see what happens here very shortly. Next, the dead in Christ, believers who are asleep, will rise first. Next, those who are alive at this time will be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air. Now, this word caught up, and we get our word rapture. Uh, people will say, well, they, you know, they, if they don't want to believe the rapture, they'll say, well, the word rapture isn't even found in the Bible. Well, there's other significant words that we believe that aren't found in the Bible. Trinity, for one. So you could ask that person, well, don't you believe in the Trinity? Uh, the Trinity, that word is not found in the Bible. The concept, of course, is as is rapture. Rapture is a Latin, has come from a Latin word, probably from the Latin Vulgate translation. But it has stuck. We call it the rapture. It's harpazo in the Greek. It refers to a strong, irresistible, even violent act to be taken by force, catch, to be snatched, to be or become seized or grasped hastily or eagerly often in order to be taken away, suddenly caught up, snatched up. The Greek verb harpazo implies that the action is quick or forceful. So the New English translation supplied the verb, the adverb suddenly to make this implicit notion clear. Here's its usage in some other scriptures, harpazo. In Matthew 11, take it by force. In Matthew 13, 19, snatches away. In John 6, 15, take him by force. In John 10, 12, snatches them. In John 10, 28, uh, let me just, I'll read this one. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Harpazo, my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. Acts 8, 38, it's a word that was used, carried Philip away. Jude 23, save others by snatching them out of the fire. The conclusion here, the rapture is a very, and I could say very powerful and decisive action by our sovereign Lord by which he will snatch believers up from this world to be with him forever. If you, if you had the idea of the rapture, that we're going to hear the trumpet, and then we're going to kind of just be kind of floating, and oh, hi, hi, Jim, you know, you're going to be, no, it's, it's powerful, decisive, it's, a, it's an action of God, it will keep the enemy from, from impeding the progress of, of any believer, see, I hadn't had that thought cross my mind before, too, that wouldn't Satan just love to do his snatching, it won't happen. It won't happen. Every, all these promises based on the gospel, the death and the resurrection of Christ, the, the teaching of the rapture. 
it will, and we're going to see even more powerfully later, uh, even more affirmation of that. This is a very powerful, the, the, the cry of command, voice of the archangel, the trumpet sound, and, whoosh, and we will be there. There will be no hindrance. Every person in the church age will be snatched up, will be caught up to be with our Lord forever. Isn't that exciting? But that's how God does things. See, we shouldn't be surprised at all, should we? God, when he's going, he sees to it. He makes a promise, he sees to it. And he has all the resources. His grace, his power, his authority, his unlimited resources, he will see to every action that he promises. The timing of the rapture is a question that comes up. The timing, and you can do hours and hours and read many, many books. <clears throat> I've tried to make this brief for us. What I think is, is very clear. God will keep true believers from this hour of trial, speaking of the tribulation. So that's why we, you hear someone say, well, I'm, I believe in a pre-trib rapture. That means that he believes that we will be, as believers, caught up, snatched up before the tribulation begins. Now, uh, there's many reasons for that. We're going to look at just two or three of them. Revelation 3.10 because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. This word here, the uh, patient endurance, because you have kept my word about patient endurance. This word means, it's hupaname, cheerful or hopeful endurance, constancy, patient continuance, waiting, steadfast waiting for, constancy, sustaining perseverance endurance in the new testament is the characteristic of the man or woman who has not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings and what this is it's the perseverance of the saints if you've heard that term that if you truly believe you will persevere you don't persevere so you don't lose your salvation that's not what it's speaking of the person who truly believes, that will be this person. You will continue, you will, you will be continuing, enduring. You will live in constancy in your devotion to our Lord. So here the promise was to them that because they truly believed and they held to their faith, then he would keep them from that hour of trial, which is, is has, it, speaking of the, the, the tribulation. Second, God will spare true believers from the outpouring of his wrath. <clears throat> now, his wrath is over this whole world, we, we learn in John 3, 36, but there's a, an outpouring of his wrath that comes during the tribulation, and it begins with the tribulation. And there's in, in Romans, we, we learn there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So, <clears throat> someone will say, well, this is just... Uh, this is just people trying to get away from suffering in the name of the Lord. No, that's not what it's talking about at all. We will suffer. We will, we will suffer loss. We're to take up our cross daily and follow him no matter the cost up to and including our very lives. It's not talking about that. It's not talking about the trouble of this world. It's not, it's not talking about the sinfulness of humans directed toward us and the hurt and the harm that that can bring. This is talking about the judgment of God. His wrath being poured out, and that's very clearly during the time of the tribulation. <clears throat> First Thessalonians 1 9, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. See, it's not explicit there, but it's speaking of in general terms that this is part of his deliverance of, from the wrath to come is catching us up in the air. The report concerning the Thessalonian believers gave witness to their authentic faith in their conversion. They turned to God from idols. See, they were true believers. And in their daily living, they, they continued on. They persevered. They wait for his son 
from heaven. See, those are strong characteristics of the person who truly believes that we are watching and waiting. The promise to be spared from the outpouring of God's wrath on the earth at the tribulation is for true believers only, not for pretenders, and not for only professors. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God has not destined us, believers, for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Conclusion here, the rapture of the church must come before the outpouring of God's wrath and judgment. Believers will be taken up to meet Christ, and the tribulation period will immediately follow. Next, the rapture is the bodily resurrection and the transformation of the dead in Christ and the alive in Christ. Now, this is simultaneous, uh, practically. Well, not simultaneous because the dead in Christ, we will not precede them. They'll be, they'll be caught up. We'll be caught up together with them. But for both groups, at the same time as the, as the catching up, as the snatching away, we will be transformed. We will become like him because we see him as he is. John writes to us in 1 John 3. That'll happen like that. So, we'll see then, we, we see this in um, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That, that body in the grave, see, and, and, and this body, that, that can't go to heaven. It, 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 this isn't glory. Heaven's glory. You know, we're really better served to, to look more than more at going to be with God in glory than really going to heaven. But it, it's, it just, it's a matter of my, my thinking because the ideas that we have sometimes of what heaven is. But these bodies will not go to heaven. In the air, they will be transformed to be glorious bodies, the work of God himself. Cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Be perishable, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. See, the, 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 the victory that death had and the victory that the second death, the judgment, the lake of fire will have for unbelievers, it was swallowed up in the work of Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? It's gone. O death, where is your sting? The sting of sin is <coughs> of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. See, all, all of this instruction, it comes to the foundation stone. Christ is the cornerstone. His work on the cross. The promise, the teaching of the rapture of the church. His promise to us, he will take us away, snatch us up, not floating through the air like butterflies, but he's going to come and he's going to grab his people and take us to be with him forever. Well, the conclusion this morning is, is point number four, and I did do this intentionally. Sometimes I don't, but I did do this intention, intentionally. It's our commission. It's our commission. And what do we do? We looked at, well, let's, let me just read the verse again. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Specifically here is these words concerning the rapture of the church. We're commissioned to encourage one another with these words. No matter the gloom and the doom, deep, deep, dark depression and excessive misery. And it's here, isn't it? There is no denying. Our world is full of anguish and pain and sadness and sorrow. And sometimes we just have to do this because we can't take it. But we have words of encouragement that far overpower any of those things to those who believe. And so we're commissioned. We are commissioned to encourage one another with these words. 
First, a warning. A warning. Fight off the strong temptation to encourage someone with these words who does not truly believe in Jesus, Son of God, for salvation. <clears throat> it is neither good nor kind nor loving to give false assurance or false hope to the person who only pretends or professes, but who does not truly believe. The encouragement of these words is only for those who truly believe the gospel. Back to our text, 1 Thessalonians 4.14, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again. If you don't believe that, none of these words of encouragement apply to you. Many preachers and teachers of the word of God, from megachurch pastors to Sunday school teachers, will be held accountable for their great, great sin because they used the truth of the Bible to affirm the lie in someone's heart. We have a great need in our day, as it has always been since ancient times, to hear God's urgent warning through the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel 13, 22. Ezekiel 13, 22, New Living Translation. You have... He's speaking to the lying prophets of Israel. You have discouraged the righteous with your lies, but I didn't want them to be sad. And you have encouraged the wicked by promising them life, even though they continue in their sins. It's great accountability. Do not use the Bible to affirm the lie. In that person's heart, it is not kind. It is not good. It is not. It is not anything good. It is damnation for their soul. Second, we have been commissioned to comfort and encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ with these words. And these words are encouragement, no matter what is going on in their life or yours or this world. This word encourage here is translated also comfort, parakaleo. You've probably heard that at one time or another. To call to one side, to call near, to call for, summon, to address, to speak to, comfort, to console, to encourage, strengthen, to alleviate sorrow or distress, give emotional strength to. Let me give a practical illustration of that. You know someone and they're terribly sad and they're broken and you say, come over here and let me hold you for a little while. And you come alongside them. You call them to yourself. And how many of us have been held like that and all of a sudden our world is so much better? This is what we're commissioned to do as brothers and sisters in Christ. We have been given commission to comfort and encourage with these words to come alongside. And it's interesting because the verb form of parakaleo is used in John 14, 16 for the Holy Spirit. If you've heard that, maybe the paraclete, the helper, the comforter. John, we've been given the opportunity to be used by the Holy Spirit of God to help our brothers and sisters in Christ through life. John 14, 16 and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Christ was leaving. He said, I won't leave you as orphans. I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another helper to be with you forever. Helper here. It's a parakletia, parakletos, summoned, called to one side, especially called to one aids and advocate one who pleads another's cause in the widest sense, a helper, a person who acts as a spokesperson or representative of someone else's policy, purpose, or cause, especially before a judge in a court of law. 
the Holy Spirit of God is our advocate. He's our helper. He's our comforter. Now, he, God, so he could do anything he, he wants, but his normal, his normal method of dealing with the, his human creation, his, he doesn't speak audibly to us. So he allows us to speak his words, as I'm doing today to speak his words, to audibilize this truth. So he, you can do that. You can touch people. I know we got social distancing and that, but you can hold people close. You can speak the words of God to them to bring this. In a sense, we're the helpers, helpers. It's way better than being Santa's helpers. The Holy Spirit of God, his helpers. <clears throat> and um, last this morning... We've been given the opportunity to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ to stand firm and strong as we look to being raised up by the Son of God on the last day. And that's what I referred to earlier in when I in at the beginning of the service that I said just grabbed me as we look to being raised up by the Son of God on the last day. John 6:37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, what I want to do is I just want to give us a partial list of the comforting and encouraging details from these verses. Seven powerful reasons to encourage the hearts of those who believe in Jesus, Son of God. And it's just straight from these verses. First, as believers, we are given to the Son by the Father. Just about could go home on that one, couldn't we? But it gets better. <laughs> it builds. Second, the Son will never cast us out. So we're given to the Son by the Father. The Son will never cast us out. Third, the Son came down from heaven specifically to fulfill the will of the Father. Fourth, it is the will of the Father that the Son should lose nothing of all that the Father has given him. Fifth, it is the will of the Father that the Son would raise up all those he had been given on the last day. Six, the will of the Father is that everyone who believes in the Son should have eternal life. This sounds like a pretty sure thing, doesn't it? And seventh, it is the commitment of the Son to raise to glory all who believe in him on the last day. Isn't that encouraging? So back to Paul's words in closing. Therefore encourage one another. With these words. Let's pray. Lord help us to do that. To, to be there for one another. To, to be before you. Bowed low before you. That, that we hear these things and know them. And they penetrate the depths of our being. So that we live them out. Thank you for the wonderful opportunity you give us. Help us to redeem the time to buy all the opportunities to know you, to love you, to serve you. Uh, thank you for this day we have to look to, to live our lives in view of when you come one day, the trumpet sound, and you catch us up to be with you. How we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>
will rise to meet him, rise up to meet him, will rise to meet him, he's coming again. We shall be like him, we shall be like him, we shall be like him, he's coming again. Oh, Father, we thank you for this day you've given us, this Lord's Day. We thank you for this message we've heard this morning. As uh, we know that you are our God and our leader, and uh, we will follow you. And we thank you for this uh, pastor's willingness to bring that message to us this morning. We pray for the ones that couldn't be here for whatever the reason, and we pray for these requests that was mentioned this morning. And uh, we thank you for all you do for us. We thank you for your leadership. We thank you for your love. We just pray that uh, we thank you for this Thanksgiving season. Sometimes we don't thank you enough, Lord, but uh, we do thank you, and we just pray that you'll continue to lead us and guide and direct us. We thank you for uh, finding out more about this uh, rapture of the church, and we just pray that you would uh, watch over and guide and direct us this week as we start a new week and start a new month. We thank you for all you do. Just pray now that you dismiss us. Give us all a safe trip home for a, a return this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.